The Bahamas was beyond our wildest dreams. But there's cries for help coming in from all over the world. There are other places that need us too. So the next leg of the adventure is going to take us to the Pacific Ocean. By far, this was the longest crossing we've done as a crew, and it was five days out in the open ocean. Okay, secured, good pack. You are exposed. You have to be on 24 hours a day. We have to run night watches, eight hours on, eight hours off. Welcome to the witching hour. This is the night shift here in Sea Legacy 1. Gotta pay attention to radar. We just went around a massive cloud that you could see about eight nautical miles from where we are now. Other things to look out for, other boats and weather. There is a cleat there for the flag and the sail got stuck underneath and it made a hole in it. So now we have to stitch it up. I have no idea how the hell that happened. A couple more stitches and it'll be fixed. It's done, it's done, we're good. Just as we turned on the engines, bang, you hear this explosion, and it's this brand new rigging that exploded on one of those days. Well, this shit happens when there's a storm coming. Really, it's 900 nautical miles with strong winds, strong currents, you are exhausted by the end of it. Paul and I have been on this boat for almost 10 months. So as we were getting closer to Panama, you could just feel it's time to go home. Come on, boys, come back here. Home for me is the rugged coast of Vancouver Island in British Columbia. I think more than anything is the opportunity to have introspection. It's a very welcome change of pace. It's just a place to feel alive, energized, and recharged. I just want to press pause for a little longer, but conservation issues aren't going away. Sea Legacy is not just Paul and I, it's this large community of people with the same inspiration to restore health and abundance to our oceans. And we need an army of storytellers. So we're excited to deploy this army of magic makers around the world. There he is. How's it going, buddy? Hey guys, good to see you. Very excited to pass the baton on to you. There's a lot of intel coming in from Central America that Costa Rica is looking to expand Cocos National Park. And so now's the time to go. This is an opportunity for the world to create the very first interconnected international marine park in history. Cocos Island, 300 miles off Costa Rica. It has all this mystique and mystery surrounding it. Pretty treacherous, there's shipwrecks around here. You show up this time of year, it's the rainy season, so it's always veiled in clouds. Its history is really known for its like buried treasures and like pirate history, and it's like the original treasure island. It's eerie, but it's beautiful. I mean, that's why it's so green, it's so lush, it's so full of life and it's one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. As soon as you go underwater, all that stuff just like multiplies and amplifies. One of the first people to come dive here and document this place was Jacques Cousteau. He said this was the most beautiful island in the world. I think he called it the sharkiest place in the world. This place has always been a benchmark in the Pacific for the health of shark populations. If Jacques could see what it looked like now, it would be devastating. This place was just fished. It was unregulated for so long. It wasn't even until the 2000s 
that any part of this ocean was protected. So you just think about how many ships fishing all day long on these popular dive sites, and they're drifting their long lines into the park. They're catching everything. Think of the impact that that can have. I've met up with biologist Randall Otteroos, whose shark tracking expeditions have resulted in priceless data that informs the protection efforts. Yeah. Because this will tell you how close you are to a shark that you can follow it in a boat. You know, I produce this information, and then as a scientist, it's my duty to publish it. But it gets published in scientific journals, and who reads these scientific journals? Other scientists. And that's where we really need the help of communicators like Andy, because those images that capture the feeling that we need to transmit. The people that I want to be inspired, to be hit emotionally, are people that sign these in the laws. And if they can connect just in that moment with the image with some pride, that can help inform their decision. They could be like, yes, we can't lose this. But getting these images and getting that tracking data is very difficult. I can't control a camera properly in these conditions. You're holding on for dear life and ripping current. In most cases, you just have one hand. I'm usually like a manual shooter. I want to control ISO aperture and shutter speed. I'm letting the A1 make all those decisions, including focus. It's been awesome. It's better if you're focused on being a good diver. Let the camera make the decision. But yeah, I mean, we've had dives where we saw zero sharks at the sharkiest place in the Pacific. Conditions, you never know, but you should be able to see sharks here. I don't know what's going on, but... Basically as void of life as I've ever seen Cocos Island. But things change quick around here. I mean, we'll keep circling the island. We'll find the good conditions. We'll find the sharks and hopefully get what we came here to shoot. Things have not gone our way. We crashed a drone. We flooded a housing. We've drifted off dives. It's been incredibly challenging. We're trying to keep morale up but everything hedges on the outcomes of these expeditions. It's just struggle, 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 and then boom. Huge schools of jacks with like a hundred sharks, and I'm right in the middle of it. One of the biggest wildlife scenes I've ever been part of. Randall was right there, surgically implanting acoustic transmitters into these sharks. It was just like a patient scan. We're starting to get images we need. We're starting to get the video content we need. Capturing these images and gathering this migration data is only the first step. We know what we need to protect. Now it's up to Costa Rica's leaders to do the right thing. Our work here is far from done, but Cocos is only one piece of the puzzle.